test this morning, are you? Amen. 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 Anybody have a word of testimony today? Just want to talk about how blessed they are. Sure. Um, in our, um, our series of Nehemiah. And uh, this is going to be the last sermon I preach out of this book. And there's a lot more uh, to be said. Um, and if you want to hear uh, what else needs to be said to the people of Jerusalem uh, from, from Nehemiah and to the people today, um, gentlemen, you can come and be a part of our Bible study group on Tuesday nights. Um, we have a wonderful time. It starts at 6.30 over at my house. And we've been studying the book of Nehemiah while we've been going through this series. But I want to uh, end up our series today with the completion of the wall. Um, if you have your Bibles today or if you just want to open up your bulletins, you, you, you'll find in Nehemiah chapter 6, uh, verse 15 and 16, Nehemiah states, he says, So the wall was completed on the 25th day of Elul. Now, we were in our Bible study this week, and I didn't know what Elul was. Do you know what Elul is? E-L-U-L. Does anybody know what Elul is? I'll give you a little information then this morning. Elul is, is the sixth month in the Jewish calendar. Um, it was the last part of August and the first part of September. So um, so you learned something this morning. Cain got educated, right? Amen. But uh, it says here that the wall was completed on the 25th day of Elul in 52 days. When all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. Amen. Praise his name. Let's pray together this morning. God, we've been talking over the last couple of weeks about Nehemiah and uh, his desire to rebuild the kingdom of God, to rebuild the wall around your kingdom, Jerusalem, to help keep out the enemies and to protect those living inside the walls. And Lord, today we come to this beautiful passage where we see that the work was completed. Lord, you know what we've been against over the last several weeks, maybe the last couple of years, uh, maybe through our history of this church. We, we find ourselves... Uh, continually uh, living with enemy uh, with the enemy attacking us, ripping apart our church and tearing people from our uh, body of believers. And, and, and Lord, we as a church, we're sick of that. Um, I think we, we've come to that conclusion that we don't want that to happen any longer. And, and, and there was some uh, rebuilding that we needed to do as a congregation. And we thank you for speaking to us uh, th through your prophet or through, through your uh, character, Nehemiah, in the Old Testament. And Lord, we, we've learned some things, and we ask God today that you would help us to see how the victory took place. What was the key element to the victory uh, that Nehemiah and the people uh, had, had, had received from you? And, and what the key point was you, God. You were in everything that they did. And Lord, we pray this morning that you would help us to see that victory is won when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Jesus, uh, victory is won when we accept God and His plans. And Lord, we just help, we ask this morning that you would help us as we preach your word. Help us, God, to learn from it. And it, it help us to apply it to our lives. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We read here that the wall was completed in 52 days. Without the help of modern machinery like cranes or trucks or any kind of machinery that would lift heavy rock. We find out that the people of Jerusalem and Nehemiah, they were able to rebuild the wall in 52 days. And while that seems uh, as, a, as, a, as a big accomplishment this morning, uh, it's not the thing that really makes my jaw drop. The thing that, that really makes me say, wow, this morning, the thing, uh, the, the thing that really impresses me is, is that, that they were able to work together. They were able to accept a plan. They were able to uh, decide on a common cause. They were able to start the work and continue the work and finish the work to its completion. Um, a lot of times we get caught in uh, it, we, 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 start a, we start a job around the house. I don't know about you guys. I, I, I'm kind of this way. I start a project, and, and then all of a sudden I see another project that needs to be started, and then I see another project that needs to be started, and I see another project that needs to be started. Before too long, I've got five or six different projects going on in my house, and none of them get completed. And, and the thing that really makes me say, wow, about this passage and about these people is that they were willing to accept God's plan. They were willing to accept the plan God laid out for them. They were able to start the work continue to work, and they were able to complete it. And, and I say amen to that. Anybody that has unfinished business in their home, you can, you can agree with that, right? 
uh, it, it's a great thing when you complete the work. But I, I look at this task, I look at it, and, and I, again, I, I'm astonished because not only did they complete it, but they completed it in 52 days. They completed a project that was one and a half miles long, 20 feet tall, and nine feet thick. And, and, and they completed it in 52 days. Now you compare that to the, compare the magnitude of their work and the amount of time it took to complete it with the amount of time it took our Department of Highways to complete the bridge project on the Market Street Bridge. A 1,700 foot, 25 foot, 75 foot project, which took two years as Tom said. And I think that many of you would agree that the accomplishment of, the, of Nehemiah and, and the Jewish people was quite a task. It was quite a miracle. It was nothing short of a miracle of God. I mean, let's face it, it, it. It's hard enough to get five people to agree on something and work together for a couple minutes. Not alone thousands of people to go after one cause for 52 days. The task of getting that many people to agree on a plan, thousands of people, uh, to agree on a plan of action alone might take the 52 days. Uh, it might take this body of believers. If we all came together and tried to decide on the color of the carpet, it would probably take us three or four months. God did something there. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. They were able to accomplish their task in such record time. They were able to complete it because of God. Because of the help that he gave them. His fingerprints are all throughout this story. And I'm going to take you through the last couple of weeks. And I want to show you where God was in all of this. First of all, in chapter 1, God brings Hanani and the others from Jerusalem into the presence of Nehemiah. And they record the current status of the city. Now, I know if you open up the book of Nehemiah, you turn to chapter 1, Scripture doesn't exactly point this out. It doesn't say that God brought them into, the, into Nehemiah's presence. And, and I know that some of you this morning would chalk that, that uh, visit from those people up as a coincidence. But I believe in my heart that God used these men these friends of Nehemiah, he used them to plant a seed in Nehemiah's heart. I believe that God was displeased with the status of his kingdom and that he needed a passionate leader to rebuild and rekindle a fire in the hearts of his people. So he sent Hanani and the others into the presence of the one he had chosen with their discouraging news. As we watch and we continue to watch, we see God use the seed that he planted in Nehemiah's heart and it moved him into a position of repentance. Broken by the current state of his hometown, Nehemiah cries out to the Lord in prayer. He humbles himself before the Lord and seeks his face. And during this time of prayer and fasting, we see that Nehemiah is convicted of his sin and the sins of his people. He cries out to the Lord for repentance. And he, he's moved to repentance through this convicting seed in, in his heart. And through his prayers of reconciliation with the Lord, the seed of God that God planted begins to grow. And we see that God's vision becomes Nehemiah's vision. I want to stop there for just a minute because I want to tell you right now, God has a vision for this church. Amen. He has a plan for you. Each and every one of us sitting here today, God has a plan. And that plan is to reach the lost souls of Fallensby and the surrounding areas with the news of Jesus Christ. And what it's going to take us, people, what it's going to take for us this morning, we have to, we as Nehemiah, we, we have to allow God to allow that seed to grow within us. God has planted a desire in my heart to see more people want to Jesus. And I hope he's planted that same seed in you. But you have to come to a point, we have to come to a point to say, Lord, uh, maybe we haven't been doing enough. Maybe we haven't been working hard enough. Maybe we haven't been investing enough. Maybe we haven't been good at protecting what we have. Lord, there, we have sinned against you. We have, we have done some things that have displeased you. And we have to make ourselves come to a point where we understand that we need God in our lives. If we want, to, if we want God's vision to prosper, if we want it to grow, we have to first seek God's face. We have to get humble before Him. We have to lay prostrate before Him in our prayers kneeling before God and asking Him for this vision. I believe that's what happened. I believe that the seed 
that was planted by Hanani and I and the others. I believe once it got penetrated Nehemiah's heart, once he heard about the city, he, he got a glimpse of what God's vision was, what God's plan was. And we see that, that he, he prays this prayer of repentance, and God reconciles with him. And all of a sudden, this, this seed begins to grow, and Nehemiah accepts the plan. God's vision, again, becomes Nehemiah. And he too wants to see the city renewed. He wants to see God's kingdom be all that it can be. And so he approaches the king. Now you know that this is a dangerous thing for him to do, right? He's a slave. He's, he's been taken captive by this Babylonian group of people. He's, been, he's in the presence of the king. He's a servant to him. Not because he wants to be, but because he's forced to be there. Um, even though he has some uh, reputation with the king, even though the king trusts him, it's still not, uh, it's still not a protocol for, or, or something that a slave would do to come before the king and, and tell him what he wants done. It, you know, you don't go before the king and say, hey, I want to rebuild my old city. I want to rebuild God's kingdom. Uh, the people that you destroyed, I want to build them back up. You wouldn't go before the king and do that. But Nehemiah in his heart, he has the, this vision, he has this passion inside of him, and so we see him go before the king, and, and, and I, I have to laugh at this, because as we see him go before the king, he says, he says uh, the king says to him, so you want to build, rebuild Jerusalem? You want to go there and rebuild it? Okay. Not something you would expect the king to say. You would expect him to squash that request. You would expect him to say, Nehemiah, do you not understand? You're a slave. You belong to me. Your people belong to me. I'm not going to let you rebuild this kingdom. Do you understand? If you rebuild this kingdom, there could be this uprising within these people, and they may overthrow my government. No, you're not going there. But we see the king say, okay. Not only does he say it's okay for him to go to the city to rebuild it, to rekindle the fire within the the Jews that are living there, but we see that Nehemiah goes before him with a request. He says, I need timber so I can rebuild the walls. And what does the king say? Okay. Doesn't make sense to me. If I'm the ruler, if I'm the one that conquering ruler, if I have, have my hand on these people and they are my slaves, I'm going to say, no, 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 thank you. I'm not going to, I'm not going to have this threat of an uprising against me. You're, you're not going to be able to do these things. But we see that the king, every time he asks for something, every time Nehemiah asks the king to do something for him, the, the answer is, okay. And I have to ask myself, why? It doesn't make sense. But I see, here, here's what I see. I see that, that, the, that the seed that God had planted in Nehemiah continues to grow in this story. He, Nehemiah uh, gets God's vision, and for some reason, the king gets God's vision. God changes the king's heart. God's vision becomes Nehemiah's vision, and, 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 and then it becomes the king's vision, and everything Nehemiah asked for, the Lord provides, not only with this king, but also with the people that Nehemiah has been called to lead. Let me tell you, I'm a leader. Not because I choose one, but because God called me to be a leader. I've been called to lead this church. And I can tell you, there are times when a leader comes in and he has an idea and he presents it to a board or he presents it to a group of people and you throw this idea out and all of a sudden it is like, no way, dude. You're not getting me to do that. You're not getting me to trust the Lord in this area. You're not getting me to do, you know. And, and Nehemiah is faced with this same thing. He, he's been with the king. He's been isolated from the people from from Jerusalem, all of a sudden he's thrown into this kingdom because God has a vision for him. He has a vision for his kingdom. He goes to the people of, of, of Jerusalem. They've been living in fear. They've been cowering within the rocks and the rubble of what's been left behind of their city. Uh, they, 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 uh, they, they don't show any uh, kind of gumption to start anything new, to try to rebuild the walls. And all of a sudden, Nehemiah is walking around the city. He takes assessment of what's going on there. He goes to the people and he says... You know, guys, we've been living in a troubled situation. This city's a mess. Look at all the rocks around you. I think we need to rebuild. And without hesitation, without discussion, without somebody saying, I have a better plan, they buy into the vision of God. And they say, let's start rebuilding. Let's start rebuilding. And I ask again, why? Why is it that nobody else had a better opinion? 
Why didn't somebody say, hey, let's ban abandon this city. Let's go build a new one. Let's go down the roadways where we don't have so many enemies. Let's make the walls purple this time instead of white. Let's, you know, why wasn't there any kind of discussion? And again, I come back to God. Because Nehemiah puts it this way. When he went to the people and he told them what God wanted to do, he says, the gracious hand of God was upon them. They begin their work. And the seed that God planted continues to grow. God's vision now belongs to Nehemiah. It belongs to the king. And now it belongs to the people. But if there's anything I've learned, anything at all in this life, it's this. There will always be an enemy. And they are usually hard to convince. Nehemiah's life was no different. In Nehemiah chapter 4, we are introduced to them. Their names are Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, and the Ammonites. And they are bent on putting an end to God's plan. You understand? We've been talking about this for a couple weeks. We have an enemy too. He doesn't like what's going on in this church. He doesn't like it when God's people are successful. And so he starts to stir up trouble. Whether he, whether he does something physically, like burn down a church, or he stirs up a fire in somebody's heart and resentment and anger, and stirs up confusion and, and dissonance in a church, we have an enemy that, that, that wants to see us fail. And we see that Nehemiah here with his enemy, they mock him. They ridicule him. And, 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 they, and they yell out insults to the people working on the wall. Uh, they encircle the city and threaten to attack. But once again, we see that God is there. Nehemiah prays and seeks God's protection and guidance. And we read that God frustrates the plans of the enemy until his plan is complete. Which brings me back to Nehemiah 6.16. You see, so far, God's vision has been Nehemiah's. God's vision has been the king's vision. God's vision has now become the people's vision. And we read in verse 6.16, When all of our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their confidence. You see, when God is involved, even the enemy is eventually convinced. Even the enemy is eventually convinced that this is God's plan, that this is God's, that this is God's vision. It, when, when it comes to completion, when we finally come together, folks, as a group of believers in this church, when we finally come together in unity and harmony and we begin to do things for God and we begin to reach people for Christ and we begin to uh, help them settle in and, and take root in our church and we continue to grow, eventually all of the naysayers out there, the enemy himself, Satan, will start to cower because he will realize that the work that's being done here is being done because of God's help. Not just because of the people here. We're good people. Don't get me wrong. I believe you're good people, and I believe a lot of you are Christian people. But i got to tell you what. If we're going to succeed, we're going to need God's help to convince. I need his help so that I can convince you of the vision he's given me. And then you're going to need his help so that you can overcome the enemy in your life. And so that you can continue on with the plan. So that we can keep dissonance and, and discord and everything else from entering into this place. We're going to need God's help and protection and his guidance. And eventually we're going to convince everybody out there that this is a place that God has planted in Fallensby, uh, Fallensby, West Virginia. This is a place where God wants people to meet him, where he wants to change lives. And we have to get a hold of that vision. We have to get a hold of the vision that God has for this church. It's not to be defeated. It's not to lay down in negativity. It's not to lay down in, in defeat. God wants to give us the victory, but we have to buy into his plan for our lives, and we have to accept what he wants to do. We will be su successful if we ask God to be a part of what's going on here. The reason Nehemiah and the people of God are so successful at their task was because they accepted God's help. Nehemiah and the people living in Jerusalem opened their hearts and their minds to God's vision. And then they bathed it in prayer. They invited God to be a part of everything they did. And God blessed them. And because of that, they succeeded. They had victory. 
over their enemies, and over their circumstances. Church, I, I beg you this morning. Let's adopt these principles as a church. Let's adopt them and apply them to our current situation. Let's begin by asking God to forgive us of our wrongs and our sins and our, tra tra our trespasses against Him, but also let's begin by asking forgiveness of our trespasses against one another. You understand that in the cities, the old cities, there was usually an outer wall that protected the whole city, that it protected the whole, like the acreage around the city. But then uh, also there were, sometimes there was an inner wall that protected the palace where the king and the queen and their family would live. And if you think about that this morning, we can repair the outer wall and keep the enemy out from, from outside, keep them outside, outside the gates. But sometimes we need to break down the inner wall that protects us. And that's what's and that which is most precious to us. We have to learn to let go and forgive and tear down the walls so that we can start building community here again. Let's start by doing that. Let's also agree to seek God's assistance in the daily task of life. Yeah, there's nothing too small or too big that God's not concerned about. He's concerned about everything that you do every day. So let's make a pact with one another before we step out of bed, before our foot hits the floor, that we ask him to be with us as we go to our jobs, as we go to our, our doctor's appointments, as we go and do our business around town. Let's ask him to help us. Grant us success. I mean, Nehemiah did that. He asked the Lord, grant me success in the, in the presence of this king find out that God did. Let's do the same. Let's adopt his plans as our own. You see, one of the, one of the best parts about this story, I, I think the most successful part of this story is what I alluded to earlier. When God brought out the plan, when he gave the vision, nobody questioned it. Nobody questioned it. Nobody said, I have a better plan than God. Everybody got on board and did what they were supposed to do. They built their part of the wall to the specifications that God gave them. So let's adopt God's plan. Let's lean on Him for strength and for protection. None of us can survive without God's help. The old song says, I need Him every hour. I can tell you, I need Him every second. <laughs> my, my foot is so big, it's a wonder I can get it in my mouth sometimes. I know I'm not alone. Let's ask for his protection, for his guidance. You see, because when we do all these things, when we adopt these principles that Nehemiah has taught us and we apply them to our lives in our current situation, we begin to understand that God is on our side. And when he is on our side, we will succeed. We too will have victory. And it doesn't have to take a year for us to heal. It doesn't have to take two years for us to heal. It doesn't have to, have to take ten years for us to heal. It doesn't take ten years for us to rebuild the kingdom of God. It could be as short a time as this, 52 days. We can put the past behind us and begin to re rebuild the kingdom. Begin taking care of business. Begin doing what God's asked us to do and winning souls for Christ. But what it's going to take is for us to openly invite God to come and heal. You understand God will not come or he's not above us. He will not force himself upon us. We have to willingly ask him to come and be a part of this body of believers. And of when we do that, we will see good things happen. We will have the victory. Amen. Let's bow our heads for God, I thank you for allowing us to come here today.